Before I get into uh, a discussion of Alberta regulation, I just, for those of you that aren't familiar with the province and, and the country from a constitutional perspective, uh, in terms of energy resource development and regulation, there's a federal role and a provincial role. The federal role is, is uh, outlined in the points on the left-hand side of the page. So they've clearly got responsibility on interprovincial trade and international trade as energy products uh, cross boundaries. Uh, large diameter interprovincial international pipelines for both oil and natural gas come under federal regulation under the National Energy Board, the NEB. Uh, the federal government has a strong role in terms of the development of frontier lands and primarily the Canadian Arctic and offshore areas, offshore East Coast primarily. Um, we have a, a very significant First Nations uh, population within Canada, as you know, and there's a group called Indian Oil and Gas Canada that provides uh, support and assists them in the development of those lands. And then finally, we do have a federal agency under the that operates um, under the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, which has a provision that allows for joint regulatory panels for large projects. Large projects like oil sands projects, uh, nuclear power plants, things like that, where there can be a joint panel of regulators from the province and uh, the federal government. But the provinces have a very important and singular role in terms of uh, resource development. The Constitution, amendments to the Constitution that occurred uh, about 80 years ago provide for provincial ownership of uh, energy resources. So royalties are the responsibility of provincial crowns to collect for oil and natural gas development. The provinces have the responsibility for energy development and they also have the, the primary responsibility for uh, energy regulation, environmental regulation of uh, hydrocarbon energy developments. So what I'm, we're talking to you about here today is a provincial regulator of the province of Alberta. In terms of uh, Alberta's energy resources, I mean, we are the primary producing area within the country. 100% uh, of Canada's production of uh, upgraded and non-upgraded bitumen from the oil sands, 76% of Canada's uh, conventional oil and equivalent uh, production the other major producing areas are Saskatchewan and uh, uh, offshore Newfoundland. 70% uh, of Canada's marketable natural gas and the other major producing areas for Canada are British Columbia and Saskatchewan. And co Canadian coal production is more broadly distributed and Alberta has 40% of that production. Before I get into a discussion of governance and regulation, this is an energy supply forum, so I want to give you a few of these statistics. Uh, in terms of uh, what, are the, what does that, those percentages translate into in terms of production? So conventional crude oil of about um, uh, 200 million barrels, uh, 700 million barrels of annual production of bitumen, and that's roughly split between mining projects and in situ. And just for those who may not be familiar with the terminology, mining project involves surface mining, so stripping off of overburden, recovery of the oil from the oil sands, uh, upgrading at upgraders on site uh, very often. In situ involves the drilling of wells uh, vertically and then horizontally in pairs. And it looks very much like an enhanced oil recovery project, very little surface disturbance. And it's called steam assisted gravity drainage as the primary technology. Wells are drilled in pairs, the upper well, steam is injected, it effectively melts the uh, the oil sand in situ underneath the ground, several hundred uh, meters below the Earth's surface, and the, the oil separates from the sand by gravity into a producing well and is pumped to surface. So uh, it's a conventional type of technology in terms of surface disturbance, and the mining projects look much more like coal mines. Uh, still significant supplies of of natural gas, and as technology changes in both of these areas, when you add in shale, a lot of the reserve estimates still don't have the ultimate potential of shale. Our previous speaker talked about shale oil. It's going to have a similar impact in terms of Canadian available production because there's significant reserves there as well. From a markets perspective, um, and again, it was, it was mentioned in the Q&A, uh, Obviously, a big portion of, uh, of deliveries of oil from Canada go into the U.S. 
55% uh, of Alberta's crude uh, makes its way to the U.S. or offshore destinations, and only 26%, only a quarter of the production stays within Alberta to go to Alberta refineries. Just to close off the, uh, the statistical portion of the remarks, um, natural gas, a similar picture. Uh, a third of Alberta's production is sold into the U.S., both in California, Midwest, and uh, Eastern seaboard markets through major pipelines. 25% uh, to other areas of the country, and about 45% is used within the province of Alberta. So this is a very uh, large um, producing area within the province, and it has uh, a very long history in terms of regulation. The first regulators were created in Alberta 75 years ago to deal with flaring, an area just west of Calgary, uh, where there was a large amount of flaring of natural gas occurring to get at the light crude oil that was available uh, that, that industry and residents wanted. And so the province came in, created a provincial regulator to, to regulate the flaring, ensure resource conservation over time with obvious environmental benefits associated with that. And that was really the start of the regulator. And over the last 75 years, as technology's changed, the issues have changed, as the expectations of society have changed, the regulator has changed with it. And what we're seeing now in Alberta in terms of the development of, of truly global scale energy resources is uh, the requirement to look at best practices in terms of regulation. And what we have moved forward with, I think, is in that category, and that's what we want to describe to you. So what do we regulate? We regulate, uh, this is current number of wells and kilometers of pipeline, so 185,000 wells, about a quarter of a million kilometers of pipelines within the province, 775 plants that process natural gas, nine oil sands mines, more than 50 of those thermal and situ pro, uh, projects that are really the future of uh, oil development in the oil sands and over 200 primary or enhanced oil recovery schemes that use different technologies to enhance recovery from conventional uh, reservoirs. Five bitumen upgraders that take uh, raw bitumen and create a synthetic quality crude oil that meet the, uh, the requirements of U.S. and Canadian refiners in terms of their feedstock. And 10 coal mines and uh, four, uh, four refineries, they call processing plants, that's actually refineries within, within the province. So I mentioned that um, two significant changes we want to talk to you about. Expanded role that Jim will talk about in terms of single regulator encompassing all forms of uh, energy and environmental regulation and a change in the governance structure and I want to talk about that now for just a moment. If you look at any regulator of uh, energy activity in North America, they basically have three primary kind of areas of responsibility. One related to governance, to ensure that the, the agency is governed effectively, it meets its fiduciary responsibility, it has a strong strategic direction, um, and it, it moves forward in the way that, that uh, governments intend it. It has an operational responsibility, and that's where for most regulators, most of the day-to-day -day, uh, regulation of the industry occurs. And that's a very significant role in the context of the Alberta regulator. And then the third area is regulators have an adjudicative function. Expertise and capability to deal with non-routine uh, matters, matters of concern to stakeholders, where you have hearings and quasi-judicial processes and decisions are rendered and those are the decisions of the regulator on those non-routine issues. So in Alberta, like other regulators, all three of these functions in the previous regulator, which was the Energy Resources Conservation Board, were all resident within the chairman and the board members of the regulator. So the chairman was the chief governance officer of the organization, responsible for strategic direction. Also the CEO of the organization from an operational perspective, and also, in effect, the chief hearing commissioner in terms of being the, the chair of the, of the bar, board members that have their uh, responsibilities as panel members on hearings. Individual board members in Alberta had governance responsibilities, actual line operational responsibilities in terms of directing staff, and of course, for members of the, of the individual panels. What Alberta has done is separated these three. 
I'm the chair of a part-time governance board. David said advisory board. It's actually a governance board and a, strict, a strictly corporate model. So we have audit finance committee, HR and compensation governance committee. CEO of the organization is Jim Ellis, who we'll be hearing from uh, shortly. He reports to the chair and the board, and he's got their day-to-day -day responsibility for the 1,000-plus employees of the regulator to manage all of the individual applications and processes that are required in a very complex industry like oil and gas and development. And there is very high expertise in staff. CEO, he's put together an executive managed team, his management team. We have a roster of hearing commissioners, full-time and part-time, separate from the organization, responsible for the adjudicative process. Technical expertise in terms of uh, reservoir engineering, geology, environmental expertise, legal expertise, backgrounds in alternate uh, dispute resolution. They operate independently of the organization. The decisions that they make in hearing processes are decisions of the regulator. The board members, there's eight of us, governance expertise. Broadly uh, representing uh, on a number of different uh, industries and environmental organizations, and not by representing, I'm saying that's their, their background. Their job is as, as, as directors. So they, if you look at the eight of us, Together, we've been on 160 for-profit and not-for-profit boards. So that's what we were looking for to provide the guidance and the direction. The key thing about this is, and there's a line up here in the chart, is performance metrics. Regulators, and we heard some of this in the previous speaker, typically it's very difficult for them to put in, to measure performance. And when you've got all of those features all lumped together within the same, it's very hard to measure performance. An independent, separate board can establish performance metrics and then evaluate. And in our case, we're in that process of beginning to do that. We're going to undertake third-party evaluation with regulatory experts in North America and the rest of the world to give us third-party validation of the performance of the regulator, both from a, a subjective and objective factor. So, how efficient is the system, but how well is it dealing with stakeholder issues and stakeholder demands? So that governance structure is one that's garnered already, even though we've been just up and running since the middle of June, quite a bit of interest from other jurisdictions to understand the model, to see how effective it's going to be. And Barry, if we get the opportunity a year from now to report on uh, how we're doing, or a couple of years from now, we'd like that opportunity. So that's the governance piece. Now I'd like to ask Jim to come up and describe the broader mandate of the regulator. Thanks.